Oh, move, 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 move. This is C.J. Chivers of the New York Times. The Marines of Kilo Company, 3rd Battalion, 6 Marines, had been pushing through Marja, a Taliban-held area in southern Afghanistan. The Taliban were resisting. Often their tactic is to hit and run, and they aren't known as accomplished shots. But on this day, they massed and attacked two Marine platoons. They also had at least one man with them the Marines considered to be a sniper, which was unusual. Hey, Bennett, the tree line in between both the buildings. Look at the tree line right in the middle of that. Deep where those impacts just were. They're squirting both ways. The squirters, as Sergeant Brian Rogers, a squad leader, called them, were Taliban fighters a few hundred yards away, trying to escape across the open steppe. The sergeant ordered several Marines, including Lance Corporal Travis Vicolo, who is 20, to suppress the Taliban positions with gunfire. I want you low, though, uh, Vicolo. I got it, I got it. Hey, At least one sniper, maybe more, was adjusting his shots. He'd almost determined the range and was overcoming the stiff crosswind. Listen closely as bullets pass overhead from a rifle heavier than a Kalashnikov. The Taliban usually shoot poorly. Not today. Sometimes in a firefight, inches matter. A dirt wall in the right place, like this one, can mean the difference between living and dying. Especially at times like now, when a gunman in hiding has found the range. The sniper is likely using a rifle like these, which were found hidden in an Afghan home several hundred yards away. They're Lee Enfields. One was made in 1942. In the right hand, it's still deadly. The Marines here were working on a clear, an early step in the phases that now define American counterinsurgency doctrine. The goal was to push the Taliban out of the area so that government might be established and security transferred from American to Afghan hands. They expected this fight. They expect more. In a lull, Sergeant Rogers ordered Marine to fire a smoke grenade near the presumed sniper position. Not too far. You're marking the building. Hit him. Yeah, that's good. That's a good shot. That's a funny, funny. Yeah. Good Its shot. plume will mark for incoming air support. The sniper replied. Oh, he didn't like that, did he? Oh, that pissed you off a little bit. This is 2 2. I, I got green smoke on the ground in front of the building we're taking very effective fire from. How copy? Afghan troops fired rocket propelled grenades. The return fire built. They're accurate. It's not a sniper. It's got to be a sniper. He's got a sniper fire. Heads up. Hey, keep your heads down. Sergeant Rogers ordered his troops back behind the wall. Get here, peel out again. One at a time. One at a time. Hurry up, Vicolo. Hurry up, Vicolo. One at a time. They're in this f***ing building. The other little one. That one right there. Woo. That one was close. Keep your f***ing head down if you're not f***ing fire. Woo. The rounds passed by helmets. Hey, keep it up. Then the cry went up. A Marine had been hit. It's Lance Corporal Vicolo. Though he had barely been exposed, Lance Corporal Vicolo had been shot through the shoulder. His bad luck was mixed with good. The round missed the bone. This was his second combat tour. He's the son of a Vietnam veteran. At first there was dread, but as his friend sensed his luck, the jokes began. Bacolo was lucid. He gave his medical tagging information. KV-4647, oh pause. What is it? KV-4647, oh pause. Had the bullet struck Vicolo an inch to the right, it would have shattered his shoulder joint, changing his life. Seven, oh pause. Eight inches to the right, it would have found throat. Uh, he's okay, he's back on his gun. One instant of good fortune means little the next. After Vicolo was shot, Marines working at a distant camp fired at least one guided ground-to-ground -ground missile to help Kilo Companies fight. The ordinance did not hit the compound from which these Marines were taking fire. It hit another nearby, 
several hundred yards to the left. At least 12 Afghan civilians were killed, including five children. An ugly day turned uglier for everyone involved and presented the Marines and Marja with a fresh challenge when the fighting would finally let up. Then, they would be seeking civilian support. You know, you really have had a, a front row seat, you know, for, you, for 14 years. You came, you, you aren't going over there anymore. You haven't for the past three or four years. But um, in light of what you said, what, what are some of the, um, what has changed over there from the soldier's perspective? And, and what, have, what have we learned? So everything changed. I mean, when we started in 2001 in Af Afghanistan, it was pretty clear that, I mean, one of the primary efforts was to remove the Taliban from power and to, you know, capture or kill or bring to justice somehow the organizers of the September 11th attacks. Over the years, the reasons kept changing, though. If you were there, if you stuck around long enough, suddenly it was about registering voters or counter-narcotics like this or uh, or development, or it became eventually what they called a counterinsurgency. And it was always a little bit under the surface, uh, or a lot under the surface, but a little bit in the public discourse, at least, about counterterrorism. And our troops essentially became occupiers. So their roles were changing, and they just changed repeatedly, depending on who the general was and where we were in the courses of the war and, and which administration it was. And they're still changing. There's a new Afghan strategy that's being announced in something like real time right now that kind of trashes a lot of the reasons that these Marines were told they were uh, where they were. But also things change for the soldiers themselves. If you went there in 2001, uh, whatever the mission was, there was the equipment that they brought to the mission. And it was completely inadequate in 2001. As the years went on, the equipment started to catch up, and the soldiers' experience of combat began to, began to change around that. And what do I mean? Like, the uniforms changed. It took a few years, but eventually they got fire-retardant uniforms. They got better ballistic plates that they wore on their protective equipment. They got different helmets. They got eye protection, ballistic eye protection, which prevents a lot of wounds that uh, are easily preventable, but no one had done anything about up until that time. The weapons changed. The vehicles changed. You'll remember. Those of you who were following the wars in 2003 and 2004, we had very little armor. And some of the troops were using what they called hillbilly armor. They were welding plates and the like onto their Humvees. Uh, as an insurgency was rising around them and firing into their vehicles and detonating bombs along the roads, they were in uh, essentially things that weren't more defensible than you know a Honda Civic. Uh, that changed. Eventually, we did get better armor. Uh, but getting armor changed the nature of the troops' experience because all of a sudden troops who were trained to be paratroopers or Marines, foot soldiers, were now locked up in these little vaults on wheels. They were like little bank vaults on wheels, which limited where they could go, which made them in some ways easier to attack, even though the wall around them was thicker. And so it was constantly shuffling. If you, you know, every few months it kind of felt like you're entering a, entering a new conflict, you know? There'd be a new set of reasons why it was happening, and there would be an ever-shifting change in the appearance of the people who were doing it. And, you know, it finally started to let up, I think, in around 2012, when we really started to, to bring it back down to where it is. And, of course, then it flared right back up. So who knows what 2019 looks like? Your role at, as a reporter, and, and you mentioned this earlier to me that I thought was really interesting, was to go as low as you could go to get as close to the troops yeah. going out on patrols. And that was, uh, there were other people doing that, but that was also different from some other reporters in that area. And why, so, what was the thinking behind that? So I had a job that was not unique, but it was different than most of them. And I, I mean, I, I'm lucky. I work for a big news organization, and we have a large staff that uh, people who approach the problems, you know, a beat coverage from different angles of inquiry. So think of journalism on a complicated subject as it's not a one-person band. No one reporter, no one editor can get their head around it. So I always think of covering a war or any complicated story as a mosaic. And what's a mosaic? It's a bunch of individual bits that when you put them up on a flat surface and you back up, it starts to cohere into more of a whole. So what's a reporter? A reporter is just someone who makes little chips in the mosaic, 
there's a lot of different inputs that make a war start to become coherent to the citizenry so they can understand it. Some of those inputs necessarily come out of Washington from where the wars are organized or out of Tampa, which is the, for these wars, that's where the Central Command is based and that's where the wars become operational, where they actually are, are you know, they're guided through Tampa and through some other bases in the Middle East. Uh, those are necessary inputs, but they're, they're not enough. Some come from NATO, some come from the Bureau staff that we would set up in Kabul or in Baghdad where the wars would be covered with a mix of local correspondents and foreign correspondents and photographers who would capture the local political scenes. These wars have, I mean, local politics drives them. I mean, in some ways we're a passing dust storm through them, but the local politics have to be covered. The local civilian experience has to be covered. It needs to be covered from the mosques. It needs to be covered from Arlington Cemetery and any cemetery in Tennessee where one of your troops came home and went into the ground. It needs to be covered from all of those areas. My piece that I chose for me was to go as low as I could to get past the public relations apparatus of the war, to get past the generals, to get past to the colonels, who even when they're sincere and accomplished and capable, often are bullshitted by their own troops, so they don't often have honest inputs reaching them. The information gets polished as it crosses up. And I would go down and try to cover people like this. I mean, there's in many ways, I'm sure many people here have served in the military or grew up in a family where someone served in the military. There are, in the very simplest sense, two very military, two very different militaries within the armed forces. There's the people who stay 20 years, and there's the people who stay, say, four to eight. They're in for one or two enlistments. The war is largely fought. If you made a pyramid, by the bottom, that's where it's experienced. Those are the people also who have almost no ability to speak for themselves. They don't have a public relations apparatus. The generals do, and the colonels do, the people at the bottom don't. So I made it my goal to go as low as I could to get past everyone and be down in the platoons and squads and just immerse myself in it, just walk around with them for weeks or months at a time, do whatever they did, let the war kind of wrap around you and eventually maybe you'd have a chip to put on that mosaic. And if you did it enough times, maybe you'd have a dozen chips to put up there over the course of a long period of time. But it was a different goal, and it wouldn't have been possible at a smaller paper. A smaller paper would have had me splitting my time between covering the politics, covering the press conference, talking to the general, and talking to people like this or living with them. I chose this model. I mean, I'm, it's pretty wild, but I think I look back on it. I never even met David Petraeus to this day. Never met him. I was invited to meet Stan McChrystal. I turned it down because I was going on a walk that day with a corporal. I just tried to stay low and have all my inputs come off the bottom. Did you see a disconnect um, between those different levels? I mean, oh sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, any big complicated organization. I mean, the way an eighth grader experiences high school is a lot different than the way the superintendent is, or I should say, experiences middle school. Excuse me, and the superintendent experiences the district. And that, that I often would think about that. The generals were kind of like the school superintendent and the troops were more like the eighth and ninth graders. It's a completely different experience. Uh, and at the bottom, as I went through it, there was a lot of those people, they don't want to stay eight. They came in for their own reasons. They're going to stay four. They're going to stay six. Uh, or I, say, I should say they don't want to stay 20 years. They don't want to do a career. They come in for four. They come in for six. They might stay eight. A lot of those people have no career ambition and can be incredibly candid to you. And what they say sounds completely different than what you would see on the news. You've taken uh, a lot of interest, you know, now, now your work back in the States um, on veterans. And that is the story that we talked about earlier, or I mentioned earlier that you won the Pulitzer for the fighter, um, is about uh, a young man who came back. He was a marksman. Uh, and had an experience, you know, kind of a bleak experience in the war, or, and um, came back and then got into trouble. And talk about that story and why you did it and what you were trying to show and what happened. So initially I should say I didn't want to do the story, or I was, I had reservations about doing the story. So what happened was a, a colonel who I used to know had gotten out, I'd known him I think since he was a major, had gotten out and gone to work for a law firm and he contacted me and said that there's a kid in Illinois who his firm was representing pro bono, uh, that he'd just been sentenced and was about to go into prison 
and they thought that he had an appeal that would be worth covering because although he was convicted of breaking into this house, he essentially had not intended it. He thought the thinking was, well, we don't really know, because he was blackout drunk, but the thinking was he'd entered a house thinking it was his own, and when he went in there, he got in a struggle inside the house. And it was right around the corner from his house, and the back porches were kind of similar, so it was a plausible theory. My initial reaction was to say, look at the facts and say, I'm not especially interested in this. I mean, he went and broke into the wrong house. There were a few women living in the house, and one of their boyfriends came out, and they got in a big fight. And there's no question about his innocence or his guilt. He's guilty. I mean, they didn't pick him up a week later off of, out, of a, out of a police lineup. I mean, they found him in the kitchen stabbed when the police arrived as the crime was ongoing. Um, and I'll just speak in Marine talk. I had some hesitations about doing the story because every Marine, and I'm a former Marine, I spent uh, almost seven years as an infantry officer in the Marine Corps. Every Marine, even those who love the Marine Corps with the deepest passion and will be buried under a red and gold tombstone, knows that some units have birds. Every unit, that's the word for it, bird. The guy who's always in trouble. Uh, and they get out of the core and they continue lives of trouble. And so I thought maybe Sam is one of them. And I was, I, but I told the guy, send me the file, I'll read it. I mean, all reporters say this all the time, right? We're all, we got 13 things going and we got time to do five and send me the file, I'll read it. So they sent me a huge court record and one night late at night, I was home on my kitchen table and you know, I decided I should look at this. Was my, actually my friend was pestering me about it, but I hadn't answered him in a week or so. So I looked through it, and I saw a statement from his company commander. It was a glowing statement about his actions in combat. And I looked, and I was like, that's, that's Scotty Cuomo. I know this company commander. And I was like, I think I got Scotty in my phone. And I looked, and I was checked, and now Scott and Cuomo were two pretty common names. There's probably two of them in the American, American military. So I texted Scotty. He's like, Scotty, are you Sammy Ciotta's old company commander? And he's like, yeah, why are you asking? And I was like, let's get on the phone. So I said, is he a bird? Because I'm being asked to go cover him and I'm not sure I want to jump in if this guy was someone you were expecting to end up in prison anyhow. And Scott proceeded to tell me a few stories about Sam that indicated he had been an extraordinary asset to the company and was a really good kid. That's when I decided, and this comes out of, you know, the beat knowledge. I mean, I knew so many Marines that had been to enough places that I actually knew his company commander that I decided, okay, I called back my friend who said, said, arrange a prison visit. Like, I can't get in. They don't allow notepads in prison, so you have to go in on a legal visit. So I said, arrange, you know, let's figure this out. And they arranged a lawyer, his lawyer, to go down to prison. I went with him. The only purpose of the lawyer being there was to carry in a pad of paper. So we walked in, we sat at the table. He shoved the legal notebook to me. I took notes on Sam for a few hours, and I shoved it back to the lawyer, and we walked out and he handed me the thing in the parking lot. And then I thought, having talked to Sam for a few hours, I thought, you know, there's really something here. This guy had come home. Um, he was maladapted because he'd been hardwired by the experience of killing. He was a designated marksman, not just a marksman. He's given a different scope, an 8X scope, best shot on the company. Uh, and his job is to overwatch everybody else as they move, and he'd killed a lot of people. And he'd almost killed many more watching them through that telescopic sight for all of those months. And he came home and he drowned himself in booze and he ended up walking into the wrong house. And I thought that in a way, because we know a lot of these veterans and they don't all end up, a lot of people struggle, they don't all end up in such an extreme difficulty as Sam did going to prison. But I thought in a way he's an archetype for the American foot soldiers experience of these wars, going, going to these places, killing, a place like this, a little different, it was Lakari. it was very close to this, not that many miles away, you'd probably drive it in an hour on a, <coughs> in a, you know, on a dirt road. Um, he'd gone and done that and the Marine Corps and um, his country had eventually said after he killed all those people and lost friends, never mind, we don't want that village after all and we just left. And he came home, that's a pretty hard thing to tell a kid. He'd come home and, and had struggled and so I thought the experience that I was going to show was about the difficulty of this arc, war and the time after, and how it had played out for Sam. I had no idea they were going to release him from prison. It wasn't my ambition to advocate for his case. 
as my, I mean, as far as I could tell the case, I mean, he had the book thrown at him, as they say, but it was a legitimate conviction. That, that, that's inarguable. No one involved would argue Sam's innocence. They would argue extenuating circumstances should have influenced what he was charged with and perhaps what he should have been sentenced with. And then we, it came a whole discussion about rehabilitation versus punishment to what would be best for Sam's long-term prospects in society. So these elements all were floating out there, but I was just going to try to tell the story of this, the arc of the combat experience for a class of Americans who we asked to do extraordinarily difficult things and we turned our back on when they came home. That was my ambition. But the prosecutor was sympathetic. Or he looked at the case. Uh, the prosecutor, again, I, you know, I spent a lot of time building a file on Sam and became, I had not yet reached a real fluency in his experience, and I hadn't yet checked all the information against his squad and platoon, his fellow squad and platoon members, which I eventually did. But I felt like it's clear I'm going to do a story on this. I need to go meet with the prosecutor and give him a heads up that I'm coming so he can review his case files. Because there was a lot of difficult questions about why Sam had been charged with what he had, why he was put in front of mandatory, uh, charged with a crime that required mandatory sentencing. Because even the judge, when he sentenced him, said, I don't want to send you to jail, but I'm an officer of the court. And the law written by our legislature binds me to send you to jail. Thank you for your service. Goodbye, go to jail. Uh, the judge, it was clear, didn't want to send him to prison. And I thought when he left in the court record, it was a judge screaming for help. When I went there uh, to see the prosecutor, it was more to say, I have a few more steps in my reporting. I'm coming back. You're the state's attorney, like a district attorney. You handle four or 5,000 ca cases a year. And you don't try very many of them, if any, yourself. So make yourself conversant in this so we can talk about it, because it's going to be an element of the story. I went home, back to Rhode Island, back to my family. Uh, uh, two days later, you know, I get a text message from the prosecutor who had pulled all the case materials and read them, uh, I thought, in preparation for an interview with me. And I, when I got the text, I had assumed that's going to be Jason calling so we can set up a time to talk. Uh, he decided to throw the case out, vacate it, release the guy from prison on a plea bargain to have him plea a, a class of felony down so he could get uh, probation and, uh, and, and mental health counseling. But that was, you know, a lot of you here in the room are probably journalists. You know, you work very hard on stories that mean a lot to you, and absolutely nothing happens. And you don't expect it to anymore. You learn that the stories often get thrown out into the great emptiness of everybody's life and the busy public conversation. You don't expect anything ever to happen. So that, that astonished me. Uh, and he actually didn't tell me then. He, all he did was ask for the defense attorney's phone number. Uh, which I then had to call the defense attorney to get permission to give him the cell. And then he called later that afternoon and just informed the defense attorney that he was going to release Sam from prison. I want to back up a little bit um, before we go to questions in a few minutes and talk about, um, you know, we had talked about earlier today, uh, the, well, there's a new movie out about the Pentagon Papers, and yeah. the Post, and so that's in our minds. And, and they were essentially a, a history of the decision making uh, in the Vietnam War, and what if what if there were such a thing for the wars that we're in now? What kind of impact would that have? None. And why do you say that? Because it's all out there. We know these wars didn't work. I mean, who in the room? Hold up your hand if you still think we should invade Iraq, <laughs> right? I, I mean, these are not. And no matter your politics, I mean, both parties, you know, uh, agree with this. And part of Trump's campaign was blasting the Iraq war, which is exactly what Obama did. He did it more pointedly. Uh, we know that the wars didn't work. But, you know, I go back to there was a sign in Ramadi, which was a, 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 a city in the Umbar province out in uh, Afghanistan, and, or excuse me, in Iraq. And Iraq, as you all know, is split between different sects and, um, you know, its Arab Muslim population, Shiite and Sunni. And this is in the Sunni belt, and this was the Sunni uh, population that had lived under the uh, Sunni president, or Sunni leader of the country, not the president, Saddam Hussein, and benefited in many ways from Saddam Hussein's reign. 
from the patronage mill, and they were completely displaced uh, when Hussein was himself displaced. And so it was a very, very bitter spot. And the Americans, uh, Marines, by the time they got there and the occupation had erupted, or the insurgency had erupted around the occupation, American Marines held a government center. And for a long period of time, it was a very tenuous position. As the Marines used to say, they come in here every night and tune us up. And the two sides would just fight. It was different than a lot of other spots in Afghanistan where you'd walk around through all these rural areas and there'd be occasional fights. Uh, and the Marines in there had written on the door, the United States is not at war. On the, to the, on the door where they all would sleep and they'd wait for the night fight to start again. The United States is not at war, it said. The Marine Corps is at war. The United States is at the mall. You know? And I think if the information about what went wrong with these wars, the endlessly shifting strategies, uh, is out there. It's available. We know it. We wouldn't be surprised if there were Pentagon Papers for Iraq and Afghanistan. We simply would not be surprised. And so I don't think anything would happen. I mean, the general who pushed us out, pushed our troops out into the canyons and river valleys of northeastern and eastern in, in Afghanistan, the, some of these names will resonate with you in Korangal, Wagal, the Battle of Ganjagal the Kunar River Valley, the Pesht River Valley, all these areas, Nuristan River Valley, Kop Keating, which you've all heard of, which was almost, arguably was overrun. It was certainly penetrated uh, by the militant forces. We poured so much energy into these valleys, and finally we just pulled out because they didn't work. In some cases, one by one, we gave up the Korangal Valley long before we gave up much to the rest. The general who was behind a lot of this thinking is now the general commanding in Afghanistan. Who here even knows that, right? I mean, he, a lot of the things he did as a colonel, he's now, in, and, we've, and we have completely gotten out of that strategy. The latest strategy now, rather than population engagement, is now going to, apparently going to be doing a lot more bombing, which is a little different than population <laughs> engagement. And uh, you don't see a word of this in the, in the larger public conversation. You do among people who do what I do. But you don't hear it, in, I don't hear it in my neighborhood, I don't hear it when I go fishing, um, I don't hear it in restaurants. So I think the Pentagon Papers could come out again and it wouldn't change a thing. And I'm sorry to say it. So there's a new project at the New York Times, yeah. um, I'm gonna let you uh, talk about that, uh, that is starting up in a couple of weeks, I think, right? Yes. And um, we'll have some of the voices from soldiers, from some of the people you don't usually hear from. Why don't you talk about that? So from 2009, I think, to 2014, we had a space on the website that kind of operated like a blog where we took a lot of submissions from soldiers in combat and from recent veterans. And it was, I always called it sort of a garage band. It, was, it got excellent editing, editing, but the editing was episodic. So there was no editor really assigned to it. So someone would get a submission, and we would um, try to get someone to do an edit and a copy edit to engage with the writer, often who had very little experience writing, much less news writing. Uh, and over time, it did get some people who wore the hat as editor, but they either left the paper or succeeded and were promoted up. And the site uh, basically weeded over and died uh, when all the blogs at the New York Times were shut down around about 2014. It was a tremendous site. It had an unbelievably engaged following inside the military, mostly at the <laughs> lower ranks. Uh, it also was an extraordinary tip engine. All sorts of people came to us throughout war to tell us things that led to you know big coverage in the newspaper. And we lost it. And for years, it's bothered me. Um, and in the last few months, we've managed to get inside the paper the funding to do some hiring and we're bringing it back, uh, this time with a full-time dedicated staff editor uh, who's going to start in about two weeks. Uh, and we, have a, we hired a staff writer. He used to be a naval explosive, explosive ordnance disposal tech. He was, you know, think of a bomb squad guy in Iraq. And before that, he was on, uh, I think they were destroyers, not frigates. He was on a destroyer. Uh, so he had a surface warfare officer tour. We've hired a former Marine infantrymen with two tours. One of them, he was on this operation, actually, but with a different unit. He was probably 
at that time about 10 kilometers to my south when I made that footage. I didn't, we didn't know it until years later when we met. Uh, his second tour, the one that was here, he was a sniper and he's now a staff journalist at the New York Times working in the Pentagon. And we've recruited from across the foreign and national desks and the people who cover veterans, a lot of our staff correspondents who are interested in submitting to it at least occasionally. So it's gonna start in about two weeks. I think she's, Lauren, our new editor, starts on the 20th. So we'll probably be up by the end of the month once she goes through some computer training and orientation. Um, and I hope you follow it. It's a digital only space. Uh, you know, it'll be online, in other words, not in the print newspaper. Uh, but we have really big hopes for getting authentic voices from people who are in these wars, uh, not just the officials. Okay, and, and last question before we go to the audience or, or really just inviting you to talk about it. You also have a new book coming out. Um, yes. And that also focuses on veterans, and if you want to share what that's about and why you're the doing that. The book is called The Fighters, and it profiles six different veterans with very different jobs um, in very different places and times from 2001 until right about now. And uh, the idea is to sort of follow the arc of the wars. Uh, again, from the personal experience, these are, these are people who actually were involved in the fighting, not in the decisions that uh, behind the fighting. So it's a... I would say it's pretty ruthlessly apolitical. I did write a foreword in which I said things very similar to what I said today, which is we all know this didn't work, or it certainly didn't go as we would have wanted it to go. That part, we can't, I mean, you can't have a serious argument with anyone uh, about any other, or with any other take. But be that as it may, I harbor an idea that's uh, in some circles unpopular, but this is something I'll fight over which is that combatants are human. The people who go to war go to war for reasons. They fight for reasons. They take care of each other for reasons. They gripe for reasons. They are human, uh, even as they commit inhuman acts. And that applies to most sides of these wars. And so what I tried to do with these guys was download their brains and download their human experience. I mean, I've got a thing I say to some people sometimes, you know, you think about what the war is, and if there's a talk about the war of Iraq, right, in the article, there'll be a map of Iraq. That's not the war in Iraq for the guy who's there. For the guy who's there, for the, the man or the woman who's running the logistics convoy that's repeatedly ambushed on the same road, the war is just what happens. It's like, what happens to me and the people I'm with? That's the war. And that's what I try to capture in the book. What happened to these people? That's what we're going to try to do on that war. I'm not going to try to necessarily make the whole gigantic paired national projects cohere because who can do it? Uh, but we might be able to show you what happened for some of the people who were committed to it. So how long is At War going to last? The digital Well, side? you can see I'm aging, so I'll fight for it as long as I'm here, and maybe the minute I leave, they'll shut it down. Uh, or maybe the war I've will got, end? I didn't hear you. Then maybe the war will end? War's not ending. War's not ending, uh, unfortunately. No, I, I think at war could uh, easily outlast me, and I hope to be at the paper another 10 more years. All right, we want to go to your questions. I'm wondering what it took to get access to the troops below the PR machine, and whether that was difficult. So these years were long, and sometimes it was harder than other times. It depended on the personalities of the commanders involved. It became less difficult as the wars grew larger and larger, because there were just more people there. Uh, I did something that was different than what a lot of people did, which was I really focused on that. So I would try to claw my way ever lower and lower and lower. When I finally got down to a squad or a platoon, I'd stay till they threw me out. You know, I'd stay a long time, I'd sometimes a month or longer, and I would generally find I was welcome there. Not always, they're occasionally. I mean, we're all human beings, occasionally the dynamic's wrong, or occasionally someone's gone there before and they're still angry about what was written, so sometimes it didn't work. But as the time went on, it got easier because I became sort of known. There was a bit of an underground about me. Sometimes I'd show up in a unit and people would say, hey buddy, I follow you, you know, and, and they would bring me or they'd give me a heads up on which unit I should go to. Uh, 
but there were times when you couldn't get out. Uh, but I would say, I don't know, by, I, I would say in Afghanistan, by the time it heated up, you know, and really was heating up in 2008, and then again, 2009, the Obama first term, where, you know, he redirected us to Afghanistan. Uh, it was pretty damn easy to get out. Well, thank you for what you've done. And I just have a question. It seems to me like I read about people like you who um, write about wars, and it seems like you subject yourself to a lot of personal danger. And I'm kind of wondering, I'd like to hear a little bit about that and how you deal with that and how your friends and family deal with that. So the answer is, you know, two syllables, one word, badly. <laughs> That's just being honest. I mean, in order to do, are there veterans here of the wars? Hold up your hand. There's going to be some. Yeah. Many of the people who will do this will tell you that to do it well, to function, and you want to function, you want to be effective. There's no reason to do it if you're not doing it with, you know, at the top of or near the top of your of your level. And if you want to do it in a way that you don't come home with a lot of regrets, which means you don't do something that harms someone else, then it's full on and you have to switch yourself off. I spent years with almost no emotions. Just switched them off. They were in the way, right? I've got to cover this and this guy's a mess. I need, I'm an observational instrument. My job, I've come all the way here. I need to cover this. So I just didn't feel anything for a long time. I mean, you just box it all up. Uh, and then you need to come home and you need to get back out because eventually you get hardwired for this. And living, well, the veterans of all the wars will tell you this. They come home, they don't fit in anymore. And same with journalists. I remember being up on these hilltops after years of doing this with the photographer I worked with. It really should be up here. He's far more accomplished than I'll ever be, you know, Tyler Hicks. And we were, we were like brothers. We were husband and wife at this point. I mean, we were together all the time for years. Uh, I mean, I knew Tyler would looking at him. I knew what he was thinking and how he was doing. I could see when he was going to come unstitched. And he's one of those guys who comes unstitched when it's quiet and he's perfect when it goes crazy. Uh, he's just calm. I remember him saying, what are we going to do when this is over? Like, go home and take pictures of the mayor? <laughs> sorry, <laughs> you know. Her, I should like, tell you. I'm very no, sorry. Her, her husband was the mayor, so. Well, there you go. No, that's actually perfect. You wanted an honest answer. Uh, so, like, what are you gonna do? You don't fit in anymore. You don't fit in with your family. You don't fit in with your friends. You only fit in with all these other people whose wiring's gone bad. It takes you a long time to come out of it. You know, I finally came out of it. Well, the opportunities, I reached a point in age where I can't really do it anymore. Look at me, I'm not in shape anymore. I'm in my 50s. I can't play 19. I could up to about five years ago, but a couple of concussions and hearing damage and hypervigilant, not sleeping. You know, I got exhausted and worn out. And I had to stop, right? But let me just speak for my cohort because I don't, you know, I don't need to display all my baggage here. But I'm going to make a list of things that happens to a lot of the people who are doing this with me over time. And some of these things happen to me, but I'm not going to tell you which. But it doesn't matter. You're, you carry. You asked about the class of people who do this: alcoholism, substance abuse, work absenteeism, social maladjustment, sometimes to an extraordinary degree, like unable to venture into crowds or really to socialize much. Divorce, loss of legs, stepping on a mine, legs blown off, unbelievable abdominal trauma that took, I mean, don't want to hold me to it, 18 months before it really was up and functioning again. Kidnap, long-term incarceration, beheading, other forms of murder, shot in a vehicle hit by IEDs. In a vehicle hit by IEDs, but the IED didn't really work. So laughing about it seconds later and then crying when no one's looking. These were the routine experiences of the population who did this over time. No, I won't say they were the routine. This was uh, the normal experience for this class of people. 
it's bad for you. It's bad for the people around you. Uh, I tell people, I get asked a lot of times by people who want to go do it, how to do it, and I tell all of them, don't. Don't. Don't do it. There's a lot of other ways to cover it. I was stuck with it. I recognize how I got into it. I didn't set out to do this. I was a former Marine infantry officer. I had a ranger tab, which doesn't mean it's that big a deal, but it means I'm fluent in Army, so I can talk to the Army. I've kind of got like a purple meat stamp from the Army, which says I can walk among Army soldiers, and they generally won't immediately tell me to buzz off. Like, there's some chance that I've been, like I said, meat stamped in one of their tactical academies, if you want to look at it that way. And I was in New York in 2001, a few blocks away when the first planes hit the World Trade Center, and I was almost to the second tower when that plane hit overhead. I had to do this. I couldn't have imagined staying home with my particular background, both like technically and tactically and socially. I couldn't imagine staying home all these years while we waged these wars. So my system, my circumstances were different. I was sort of s slotted for it, and I, I mean, I wasn't going to stay home and in another beat because I would have felt guilty all the time. And when I, I know this because when I went out and came back and I'd be home for a month or two, I felt guilty the whole month that I was home because I wasn't back there. That said, you know, if you don't have that background, and as the wars now have a shape in which we generally understand them, I think it's less essential for people to do some of this, you know, capturing the, what I did, capturing the actual experience of combat. I think that is reasonably well framed, and we'd be better served covering the mosques and the cemeteries and the civilians and all of these other chips in the mosaic. And the other thing that's happened is now it's a much smaller opportunity to go see and immerse yourself in small unit combat. Why? Well, we did it in Libya, and we started to do it in Syria, and then we were all getting kidnapped. So the map, like the threat map, if you think, oh, the map's red, but I think I can dash in there for a couple weeks and get out all right if I go with this guy because he knows how. And he's got, you know, his uncle runs this road, so we'll be all right if I stay in this area. With it. No, you don't do that anymore. The map went black. You go in there, you know you're probably not coming back, and nor are the people you take with you. So we lost a big chunk of the map to the criminality. And now the American military, you know, in the height of this, when that video was taken, I mean, we could go chart it out. There are probably about 200,000 American forces deployed on the ground in Afghanistan and Iraq. There was an enormous opportunity to go out there and try to look at this and understand it and document some portion of it. Now we've probably got, in the two wars, closer. I mean, don't hold me the numbers, because again, I don't have the chart in me. It's probably under 15,000, right? So it's less than a tenth of what it was. And our posture's different. We're more in advising and training roles, so you can't go find it. Uh, no, no one's going to go do two months. I won't say no one, but very few journalists are going to get the budget or the, have the inclination to go two months and cover the training of the next cohort of Afghan soldiers. So it's it's a different environment. I was a <clears throat> I was a reporter for a good number of years. I've never heard observational instrument, which which sounds actually much more profound than whatever I did for a living. Um, we have a question over here. There was a point in U.S. journalism where the the gore, like of the Vietnam War and battle scenes and civilians, you know, shocking ways that it was brought home to the public about how gruesome war really is, or classic civil rights marchers getting chewed up by dogs and beaten by police, just just that had a shock value, but also that brought it home to people to what what it is that our country is involved in. Yeah. What happened to that? Well, I think it probably predates these wars. The coarsening of the American public discourse and the, I mean, just go to rated R movies, right? People were sensitized to a lot of violence. We're actually kind of jonesing for more violence and asking for it from the filmmakers and rewarding it with ticket sales. That happened long before 2001. Uh, we're, I mean, our music lyrics are different. I'm using words now that 20, 30 years ago we wouldn't use in a public setting like this uh, so readily. Uh, I think the, and it's even gotten worse. I mean, we consume 
Twitter started to shut it down and Facebook started to shut it down, but there's been a, there was a period of time in the last few years where we were consuming snuff films regularly that were being made for us to consume by the jihadists, right? I mean, I still have access to some of the, you know, the, the channels, they call them, that the ISIS uses to distribute their meshes. It's just, it's just a violent peep show. I'm convinced there's nobody on it but journalists and intelligence officers. You look at it, you can see how many members. There's only three, four hundred members, and the channel pops out, and then it pops up with a new name almost simultaneously, and you get referred to it, and you go there, and it'll have a thousand members, and then it'll pop out. That's nothing on the globe. I mean, the whole way we approach stuff has had the, you know, the filters pulled off. But I think that happened long before I got involved. I think I arrived. And I, I work for a place where we're still, I mean, I used to hear when I started, we have the muffin gagger standard in the New York Times, which means someone's going to be looking at this while they're eating their breakfast. And if you make them choke on their muffin, <laughs> then you're across the rating line, right? Uh, the internet doesn't have a muffin gagging standard, nor do rated R movies, which predated the internet. So I, I just think everything got coarser. You said these wars are a mosaic. Now, you only painted one, one piece of the mosaic. The piece of the mosaic that stands out for me is from my former wife, Kathy Kelly, who was back and forth to Iraq in both wars, 1991, 2003, and between during the sanctions, and has been back and forth three, four times a year to Afghanistan since uh, 2003 to the present, with uh, three times nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, Kathy Kelly. Did you ever meet her in Iraq, in uh, Afghanistan, in Kabul, with uh, Afghan youth for nonviolence? The piece of the mosaic is that mosaic of young people in Iraq, or in, Af in both Iraq, in Iraq and yeah, Afghanistan. Both, both, yeah. Did you ever meet her in Afghanistan? I didn't meet her in Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, because I was very rarely in the capitals and, and, t and tended to be very briefly. Most of my work was in the more rural areas, uh, out away from it. I wish I had met her. And I agree, those are part of the mosaic. And what I, you know, I put up my chips, and she put up her chips, and hopefully, we can have more chips like that. One of the things I've been talking about with that, with the at war space that we're going to uh, reanimate here or resuscitate briefly uh, or soon at the Times is we want uh, voices like that. In fact, one of my, I haven't been that active in the paper, like you won't see a lot of bylines from me lately, is we're trying to like actively recruit Afghan voices and Iraqi voices. So like, I'd like to see an essay from the people whose house was hit there. I'd like to see essays by a captain of Iraqi police or by a sergeant of Afghan soldiers. I think that would be valuable. We tend to see it only through our lenses. My lens is, they're interesting. I've been well rewarded for them. People react to them. My lenses are narrow. They're not enough. The way I approach it, it's nothing. I don't even read coverage like mine, but I already understand it. I go and read, like people say, who do you read? It's a question I get asked a lot. I read mostly female writers, because they can access parts of these wars that I can't. As a man, I could do almost nothing in Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, in the rural areas. In the capitals, it's a little different. It's more liberal, just like Nashville will be more liberal than other parts of Tennessee, and Providence, where I live, is more liberal than, you know, down by, uh, or, or out by Burrowville. I mean, I was always working in areas like Burrowville, or, you know, think of the Appalachians. I was working in areas that were deeply conservative. I could not interact with women, which means I'm missing half the war. The war's not just the guns, right? So the, what we hope to create is a space where we get more female voices, where we get more civilian voices, where we talk about peace and not just about tactics. I can write about tactics all day, and there's a bunch of people in this room who will follow me, and we'll have a vibrant discussion. But tactics are nothing after the hour of tactics is over, right? Once you get out of that tick, 
uh, sort of the, the acrid, stupid acronym, these troops in contact. Once you get out of that fight, that immediate fight, and you've pulled back and they've pulled back and both sides have tended to their wounded or their dead, tactics are now nothing again. It's about everything else, and that's what we're trying to hope to capture. But I, I realize the limits to what I do. You know, I spent years and years doing it, and it only tells you a slice. That's why I say mosaic. We all need to put up different perspectives, and mine gets celebrated, but it's it's damn narrow. As a former uh, military person, I I um, describe this. You like to talk about tactical situations, and I have a uh, strategic question for you. Uh, that's always uh, bothered me. I, I was opposed to the um, uh, our participation in the Iraq War and starting the Iraq War. And I know you, you must have some perspective on this question. What would have happened, or what do you think would have happened, if we had put all of the resources that we put into Iraq into Afghanistan, plus what we put into Afghanistan? What would Afghanistan be like today? You mean if we hadn't diverted the attention in 2002? And put the resources there. Yeah. Yeah. And it started in 2002. I mean, we can go back now. There were things we missed then because they weren't visible to us. Like by mid-2002, all sorts of American Special Forces teams were being given vehicles, which they never had before in their team rooms, uh, at, you know, at their Special Forces groups because they were getting ready for the invasion of Iraq. And those things happened. Like we like to say, well, there was a political dis the political discussion hadn't even really started yet, and the special forces already were getting the equipment to invade. I mean, the the administration, the machine knew it was going to war long before the public conversation started to discuss it. So your question's one I think about a lot. I'm going to answer it now. What would have happened to Afghanistan if we had kept our focus on Afghanistan uh, and not gone to Iraq? There was a time when I said, wow, it would have turned out differently, wouldn't it? It would have maybe had a chance. That's the reasonable position, or so it seemed. I thought that for a while. I don't think it anymore. I don't think that the military is a capable foreign policy instrument for at the scale we were doing it, even with all the Iraq resources that would have done much to, for Afghanistan. I don't think the Afghans largely wanted us there. I think they wanted to be mostly left alone. I don't think you get a bunch of 20-year-olds to drive around in vehicles in a foreign country and can't talk the language and, and are armed to the teeth and nervous that people are going to get along. I don't think the people of Tennessee would get along if a foreign army was driving around in here. I just don't see it happening. I think, you know, I don't think I'd get along with people who walk through my garden on patrol or if my neighbor shot at him, came into my house and searched it and flipped over all the furniture on the way out, which was routine behavior. Um, I don't think it would have, I, I think we still would have had trouble in Afghanistan, even if we didn't go to Iraq. And I say that watching the things we tried to do in Afghanistan that were irrelevant to Afghans, like going out and registering voters, right? How'd you like to get shot on a voter registration patrol on a country that doesn't even really want an election? Right? I don't, I mean, I watched them. I mean, we took on these, these projects that to us are understandable, like women's rights. I get that. You get that. Everyone in the room gets it. But what if you are training young women to go home and exercise their rights and then they're being beaten up for it? Are you the good guy in that situation? Should you allow the society to evolve or should you use your military to accelerate what you think? is its evolution. I, I think if we had, I used to think, wow, if we hadn't gone to Iraq, things might have worked out in Afghanistan. But having watched the military bungle its way through Afghanistan once they finally showed up, I think they just would have bungled their way across it sooner. That's my honest answer. It's completely hypothetical, though, because we don't know. So it takes an asterisk. I think this may be our last question. Is it possible that the American public, in part, and, and maybe pol politics also, we become so disengaged with this, we, how, how many of us really care what's going on now in Afghanistan or you know, Libya or any of these places? It's the fact that we now have a volunteer army, there's no draft, so that you know the people that are doing this are, 
you know, a fraction of 1% are doing it, and all the rest of us, my kids now, they're, they're not even involved, in it, nor do I care, you know? Would I care if my kids went over to Af Afghanistan? Yeah, I'd get emotionally involved. And I'm wondering if the, the question that I have, and it, it's, it's a leap, but I'm asking for your perspective on it, is the fact that we now are all volunteer and no draft, and therefore the vast majority of the American public are completely removed from this whole consternation and, and frustration and, and threat, and, and as a parent, you know, my kid. So would a draft require the citizen's consent or participation in the war, and would we have a different perspective on it? Is that your question? Would the society as a whole, maybe? So, I mean, then you get into this, and this is something, you know, I served in the Marine Corps in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and we used to ask ourselves that question also as a hypothetical like yours. That was one then, you know, this was uh, not too long into the vol all-volunteer force in the 80s, right? I mean, there were still people in the service who had come in during the draft, and I was trained by, you know, Marines who had fought in Vietnam or been at these things like the Mayaguez incident. You know, my first drill instructor, second drill instructor was, had participated in the Mayaguez incident. And so we were the volunteers. We were this new thing, and we tried really hard to be Marines. We tried hard to, it's hard to be a Marine. It sucks. It's really hard. And not just the boot camp. I mean, the tactics and the life and being in the infantry is a grind. And I used to say, thank God we don't have a volunteer service. It's hard enough to get us to do it, and we all held up our hands. You know? <laughs> Imagine trying to push a bunch of people through here who you dragged in <laughs> kicking and screaming. It wouldn't work. Uh, so generally, I think as a exercise in civics, yes, the all-volunteer service or I'm sorry, the, the conscription service, the draft, would give us a different relationship as a society with our military. That said, if you're in the military, it's hard enough to work with the volunteers. I don't know as a military exercise how it works if you just stuff it with a lottery system. Uh, not that I believe it would be a lottery system. There's enough corruption in this country that it would all be rigged. Not all, but a significant portion of it would be rigged. Uh, but if it was largely a lottery system or significant fraction was a lottery system, how would it work? Uh, I'd say it's a, the answer is a different question, which is like, I think we need to like, you know, an engagement with an understanding of what it is our foreign policy is about instead of being so reactive. We're reactive to almost everything. Uh, if the casualties was what you're talking about and the disruptions in family life, which is also what you're talking about, that are inherent in military deployments were scattered more randomly across the population, we might have a different relationship with our empire and at this, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a civic body. So it probably would be good. Having been in the military, though, that'd be a scary ride uh, if you just, if you staffed it randomly. Well, Chris, thank you so much for the talk. He'll be around for questions if you want to.